Hi, everyone. My name is Kim Porter. I'm the Executive Director of Be a Part of the Conversation. Thanks for joining us for Recovery Lives Here. We're, this is our first time talking about recovery housing. I think it's long overdue. I want to give a shout out to my friends from who are the leaders of parent partnership meetings because they came to us with this idea and said, we really need navigation. Family members need the help and as well as people who struggle with a substance use disorder, you know, trying to find, navigate the system that's ever evolving. And so I'm really grateful to um, all of you for being here and excited about our panelists this evening. Um, first, I want to thank our community partner, the Montgomery County Office of Drug and Alcohol. Um, regardless of where you live, you're welcome here, but we do appreciate the funding that we receive from Montgomery County, as well as a few other counties in our neighborhood. We cover kind of a five county area in southeastern Pennsylvania. Um, also, I want to let you know that we're recording this program. Um, any questions that are asked in the Q&A or the chat will be private. You will not see those on the recording. So please feel free to ask any questions as we go along. Um, my colleague Bob, Bob Lamb is on as well. So Bob and I will be keeping an eye on the chat and the Q&A. And um, at the end of all the presentations you're going to hear, then we'll get to all of your questions, at least as many as we can. And thank you for those who submitted questions ahead of time as well. Uh, the, that recording will be available tomorrow morning, and I'll get to that in a minute where that's going to be. At the end of this, though, you're going to be prompted to take a survey. It will pop up on your screen, whatever device you're using. Um, please take that survey, even if you've done it before. It really helps us so much to know what kind of information you might want in the future, how we can help with other topics. Um, was this program helpful or not? What anything that you would like to share with us, we'd love to hear from you. <clears throat> so the follow-up for this, I mentioned the recording, um, will be on this page of our website. And Bob is gonna be sharing some of these links in the chat. Um, but this page, not only will have the recording, it'll have that survey if you don't catch that link right away. Um, it will also have information about our panelists this evening. You'll also find a lot more of supportive information. So just a note to our, our other presenters tonight, anything that you guys can bring up that you would like me to add to that follow-up page, um, our participants and people who watch the recording would really like to be able to access some of that. So sometimes somebody will mention a great book or a great resource or whatever. Um, just share that with Bob or me and we'll make sure that it gets loaded onto the website. And just an FYI that Follow-up link is actually dash housing, not recovery. Oh, for God's sake. Thank you. <laughs> no, it'll, be in there. it'll be in the chat momentarily under housing, not recovery. My bad. I wonder where that came from. Oh, my God. Okay. So <laughs> I was just telling some of the panelists, this is our like 112th program since COVID on Zoom. So I'm, and we're going to have a little bit of a mini hiatus after our next program, which is later this month, um, which I hope we'll hear more about. But anyway, and I think I'm zoomed out. <laughs> so sorry, guys. Thanks, Bob. Good catch. Um, I always like to mention the fact that we have these parent partnership meetings. And I just said that this is where this idea came from. Um, you spoke and we, we are responding. We wanted to help you with uh, navigating housing, but parent partnership meetings are very much like Al-Anon or Nar-Anon. Um, they are not a 12 step program. They're a place where parents, caregivers, guardians, um, any, anyone who is looking after someone or love someone with a substance use disorder, uh, we come together and we share, we have crosstalk, but we kind of need that sometimes we parents. I'm the parent of someone in recovery. That's how I got into this work. And so um, these meetings take place sometimes on Zoom. Those are the green buttons on the calendar that you'll find there. And sometimes in person, which are the purple buttons. And then we have a hybrid here and actually Chestnut Hill last night just started back hybrid. So um, anyway, please visit that page for lots and lots of help if you are a parent, caregiver, or guardian. We have a YouTube page that I wanted to mention because we have a lot of content on there. We really love it when you join us live. I'm so glad you guys are with us because then you get to ask our awesome panelists lots of questions. So that's really good. But please um, you know, know about this website and know, I'm sorry, know about our YouTube channel subscribe to it. That way you'll get notifications when a new program comes up. There's some great stuff on there. We've got some really amazing, my fact, I do say so, we've got some amazing programs recently that I hope you will check out. 
Wow, what a panel we have for you tonight. We're going to hear from Joy Honer. I'm going to ask each of you guys to kind of introduce yourselves a little bit. I'm not going to read bios. We're going to have Joy Honer and Fred Burke and Megan Cohen and Keith Murphy and Michael McCord. We also, I, I neglected to get Jody Skiles. I hope I got your name right, Jody, um, from the Pennsylvania Department of Drug and Alcohol Programs, or otherwise known as DDAP. Um, she and Fred are with us from DDAP tonight, so you'll be hearing from all these folks this evening. So I'm going to shut up and stop sharing and say thank you for being here. Joy Honer, take us out. We're going to get us started. Uh, hi, everyone. My name is Joy Honer. And I am a substance use disorder treatment professional as well as uh, an alumni director. Um, I'm also a person in long-term recovery, um, which means for me, I've been in recovery for, uh, I've not used a substance for 40 years and some odd months, which is crazy in a really good way. Um, very grateful to be here. Um, and, and honestly, I, uh, I attribute that to, um, partially to going to a recovery house in early recovery that bridging that gap for me was an important piece of my journey. Um, and so I'm grateful to talk about that as somebody that's been in the field for many years. Um, I've actually been in the substance use disorder field for 32 of them. I feel I feel older when I talk about this. No offense, but you know, I'm like, oh 30. But um, you know, um I I recognize and I've been able to see what recovery housing and, and a continuum of care does to help people in early recovery continue their journey. So um it's been really um important to me and important to communicate the value of that. So, you know, I, 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 because I work in, in mostly inpatient treatment settings, I've had a variety of uh, situations where people needed recovery housing. Sometimes, even if they had the option to return home, sometimes people are appropriate for recovery housing just because they need the extra support. Um, because they have supportive loved one, you know, love uh, that just because they have supportive housing or supportive loved ones, if they have the opportunity to go to recovery housing and continue their journey in a safe, supportive environment, sometimes that's enough. But very often, um, or m more often, a lot of times treatment is recommended, continued care is recommended, or another program is recommended when people demonstrate behaviorally that they need a level of structure, a certain level of accountability. Um, it could be that their home life or their setting at home is not stable enough. It, it can be, I mean, there are many, many reasons why people um, need to continue their journey. And I'll, and I'll go over some of that specifically. I do want to acknowledge that there's been a lot of studies and if you look up continued recovery housing or uh, recovery housing or continued treatment, over and over again, the numbers demonstrate that they're better, they're higher outcomes to people who continue their journey in this manner. So for instance, I, 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 you know, I kind of wanted to be prepared here and I looked up some of those studies. And in one case, they found that after a 24 month follow up for people who went to Oxford houses. Now, Oxford House is probably one of the lowest levels of care we're going to discuss. But after 24 months, 31% versus 64% returned to using. So that's a 50% difference. Um, there was a significant increase in their monthly income. So 50% increase in people's monthly income. Um, and so, and they had a lower incarceration rate, 3% versus 9%. <clears throat> and I like, I like talking about research because we can get emotionally involved with things and, and sometimes we forget to look at the facts. And this is just one study, but there are several studies out there that concur that recovery housing and taking that next step is important for people. Um, so when, you decide, when we decide in inpatient treatment, when we talk about levels of care and who we're going to, you know, where we're going to send people, we look at several things. Now, some of the recovery housing organizations have identified uh, four levels of care, and they are um, peer-run, monitored, supervised, or a service provider. And so that's one organization that the National Association of Recovery Residences identify as those tiers. Um, and so what we look at is 
where is the per how far how severe is the person's use disorder? So, um, how is their functioning? Are they duly diagnosed? Was it, do they have medication that needs to be monitored or will they have to take medication? Are they on medication management as part of their recovery program? Um, what is their age? Um, do they have a uh, career employment? What kind of, are they in a career or do, have they had kind of spotty employment? There are many things that people use and the clinicians use to make some of those decisions. So one of the things I would tell family members is early in the treatment process, it's good to start that discussion. The earlier, the better. No one, it's, it's not in the best interest of the patient. And I don't mean the day that they're detoxing, you know, the first day they're detoxing. Let them, you know, get a little, uh, a, little, a little settled in and let the assessment process do its magic. But it's really important to, to get to begin that discussion once staff identifies that that might be the best outcome. Or if there's a family member, the family's saying, you can't come home this time. This is not, I, you know, this is not a, an environment um, it, it, where, where, where I feel you could be safe or I feel safe. And, and people are allowed to set that boundary. That's okay. Um, so the four levels, again, are peer-run, monitored, supervised, and then a service provider. Um, so, so as they make that assessment, as the staff may be in a treatment center, look for programs, they're gonna have some conversations about where those people fit. So for instance, level one, which is peer run, a lot of the decisions um, have to do with the person's motivation. Are they self-directed? Are they self-motivated? Are they attending everything without getting dragged out of bed in the morning? You know, are they ready to work? Are they ready to, you know, are they motivated to do the work that they need to? Um, do they, they don't need, again, and I'll go back to, for the peer run or places, um, they don't need, need medication management or they have an identified provider that can do that for them. Um, they don't have a large budget. One of the things that we've run across that we have to be mindful of is that you can't match the level of care for, to something that people can't afford, um, that you're setting themselves up for failure. So making sure that the person's income and ability to pay match the facility. And sometimes that's a, that's a, you know, a balancing act, but it needs to be done. Um, and um, so for level two, which is really uh, a monitor, there might be a professional there, there might be a peer support specialist, there's probably a house manager. So the level one is more like an Oxford house where it's um, democratically run, the peers run it. And yes, there's kind of an overall arching structure, but the peers who are in the house run it through a democratic process where a monitor recovery house has like a house, has a house manager, typically um, some, that's not somebody who's a licensed professional typically, but somebody else who's in recovery and maybe the person who lived there. Um, so that is uh, level two. Level three is supervised. So there might be administrative oversight. There may be some license and, and licenses. I'm, I'm sure Fred will talk about this. So licenses vary some from state to state. Clinical services may be offsite. They might not be attached to the, you know, the facility. Um, and then there's long extended care, long term, um, higher levels of care that have professionals on site regularly that do a lot of the treatment work. So, um, so assessing appropriately what people need is, is, is an important part of this. And I, I'm not going to go through the other three because I realize like the time is flying. So mm -hmm. I have other things that I want to make point of. Um, I wanted to mention, I talked to our PCC department and I asked her, well, Sarah, what do you guys look for? And she said that they look for houses that are CARF certified, that there are uh, houses that are CARF certified, vetted by our marketers, clean, good structure, support drug testing, and have oversight. We look for healthy, right-minded owners and houses that allow MAT, 
medication assisted recovery, houses that um, and houses that involve family members. And so I think that's um, I don't I I I don't know the acronym for CARF. I know that I should know the acronym for CARF. And my guess is, is that Keith and Jody know the acronym for CARF, and they will let you know. Um, red flags: receiving more than one patient complaint. We all know patients struggle. Um, house managers in very early recovery. No support structure or oversight. Houses that do not have a solid medication assisted recovery plan for and non vetted houses. That's where, and she said ultimately the goal is a smooth transition from door to door. Things don't tend to go well when people go home in the middle. You know, I just want to go home and check on my dog. I just want to go home and see this or want to do that. And things don't tend to turn out real well when that happens. Oh, thank you very much. Yeah. So I wanted to make a few other notes because I'm running out of time. And there were things that I, I, I as a person in long-term recovery that has been around these organizations for a really long time. Um, um, in addition to the earlier, the better. Just because somebody uses in a recovery house doesn't necessarily mean the recovery houses ha should have a bad reputation. Let me explain why. People with use disorders sometimes return to using. Now, what the recovery house does when that happens is the important part of that. What is their process? How do they address it? How do they follow through with it? But use alone in, or in, a, in a facility that treats people with substance use disorders um, is not a, an indicator of the quality of it because people do tend to return to using during different times in their process. So I always warn like people say, oh, that place is horrible. Somebody used there last week. Well, we're housing people in recovery and they might struggle with use disorder. So I always like to make that distinction so that people are aware. Um, the other thing is um, I do believe that the peer recovery support movement has been valuable in teaching people how to approach recovery. And I think that most houses can have, that have, I think most houses that are other than Oxford houses and anything that's managed really is a quality house when they utilize peer support. Um, and these are people that have learned how to communicate recovery principles in a structured way. And they're held accountable for their license and they're given training, um, which, which, which is something that I personally um, look for in recovery housing. Um, and then I, 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 have a lot, I, I have so much more that I can say. I would say do your homework like any other any other situation, I'm sure that when your loved one entered treatment, you did some homework around that. Um, what what kind of what kind of um, how are they looked at in the community? Do they have references? What talk to other people in the recovering community? Not people that went through that treatment program, but how's their relationships with the recovering community? And I also want to note that you know we know that this. This universe and um and oh I got one more minute nice I know that we know that this universe has expanded gratefully to embrace many pathways to recovery. If a recovery house is only supporting one type of recovery, I would be hesitant to refer there. I would be concerned because there are so many paths now. It's really about saving lives. Look for those programs that support people um, taking their journey in, in many, many ways. Dharma recovery, um, you know, 12 step recovery, celebrate recovery. There's many options, and um, it's important that people be given those options to be successful. So, I think I, 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 I have so much more, but I think we'll answer some of that in the other questions. And as and some people of these other beautiful people will tell part of their stories and probably include some of that stuff. So I am going to yield to the next wonderful presenter who is. Burke and, and Jody Skull. So yeah, take it away, Fred. Thank you, Joy. <laughs> So Jody, um, Jody's going to be doing the first part of the presentation. I'm going to try and share my screen. 
Can you see the slides? Yep. Thank you, Fred. All right. Thank you. Good evening, everyone. And thank you for allowing me to jump in. And thanks, Joy, um, for your wonderful talk. Sorry to take over. And um, I just, I'll have a question for you on the panel. Um, what is a PCC at the retreat? So I've, I've never heard that. I don't know if we have to wait. Primary for care, our patient care coordinator. Oh, okay. All right. Thank you. Sense. Okay. So thank you. So um, my name is Jody Skiles, and I'm the Bureau Director at the Pennsylvania Department of Drug and Alcohol Programs. I'm the Bureau Director for Program Licensure. Um, and I am here to give a very quick history of DDAP. You all are here to hear about recovery housing, and we thought that it would be good to just give you a history of DDAP and kind of who we are, what we do, and why we are here. Um, so this PowerPoint presentation briefly is, we're gonna do the DDAP overview. We're gonna talk about what my bureau does in the Bureau of Program Licensure. We have the divisions, um, the division of uh, drug and alcohol program licensure in our division, what the divisions are. We're gonna talk about recovery houses, what is a recovery house, the recovery house regulations, what Fred does, what his staff do, um, what he did this week. Um, he just got back from a, a whirlwind trip and we're gonna give you some resources and then we'll have some contact information. So you can go ahead to the, here we go, the history of DDAP. So we were formerly an office, then we became a bureau. Um, under the Department of Health. And then we, Act 50 of 2010, we were able to become a department. Um, we, the single state authority, the SSA, which is um, Jennifer Smith, our secretary for substance use disorder since July 1st, 2012, we became a department under um, the governor. So here's our secretary. If you don't know her, she reports directly to the governor, Governor Wolf, um, the office of the secretary. Um, we have a chief counsel, a chief of staff. We have um, a special assistant. His name is Steve Brosh. We have policy director. We have a director of intergovernmental affairs. We have a legislative director, a communications director, a press secretary. We are actually a full bloom department. That's our executive team. And under the executive team, we have three bureaus. We have a Bureau of Quality Assurance and Administration. We have a Bureau of County Program Oversight, which you talked about the Montgomery County SCA who funds this, this program. They are under, they, they would report to the Bureau of County Program Oversight. And then you have our bureau, the, Pro, the Bureau of Program Licensure. In, under this bureau, um, I'll talk a little bit about our bureau. We have two divisions. We have the Division of Licensing Inspections and they go out and they inspect all the licensed treatment programs. So that means programs like Joy, where Joy works, the retreat, all the rehab facilities, all the detoxes, all the partials, all the outpatient programs. Any, anyone that provides drug and alcohol treatment services in Pennsylvania must be licensed. And we go out and license all of those programs. So that's our one division. And then under our division of licensing operations, we have um, a separate division that takes all the complaints. They license all new treatment programs. They review and approve all exceptions all anything that a, a provider says they want to not follow a regulation for a particular reason, they must submit an exception request. And then the new recovery house reg regulations, the new recovery house licensure. And now <laughs> Fred, he's going to talk about what you're here for. <laughs> Thank you, Joey. How quick? Okay, so recovery houses, and this is why we're here. Um, so recovery houses, um, the substance abuse of mental health services, SAMHSA defines recovery houses as safe, healthy, family-like, substance-free living environment. 
um, support individuals in their recovery from addiction. Um, in recovery houses, there are no, no treatment takes place in recovery houses. So you can live in the recovery houses and be in an outpatient treatment program, but no treatment takes place in the recovery house. It's strictly a transition back into the community. Um, and we have, we have a facility locator. So if people are interested in finding out what re, uh, recovery houses that are licensed are, then you can go to our webpage and, it, and go to the uh, facility locator and you'll be able to identify which recovery houses are um, licensed in which parts of the Commonwealth of Pennsylvania. So the more we license, the more they'll be on there. Um, so it's easy to find which houses are licensed. And now the difference between recovery houses and halfway houses. Halfway houses are um, a home-like atmosphere, just like recovery houses. Um, they're accessible to public transportation. Um, they have a lot in common, but except, except for a halfway house, um, this treatment that actually takes place in halfway houses. So it's um, it's certified by more than just us, um, and they usually have a, a certain amount of people, and they usually carry a certain population. However, recovery houses, there is no treatment, okay? And the whirlwind uh, trip I just got back from was from Philadelphia licensing 25 recovery houses. So, yes, it's really been busy. Um, so since Act 59 of 2017, um, the department decided to, 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 to create regulations for recovery houses that are receiving public funds or referrals and um, policies and procedures were required as a result of that. Okay, so just some of the policies and procedures, and just like Joy said, um, there are a lot of policies and procedures that the recovery house are gonna give or present um, to us so that we can monitor them. Um, it's really important because what I'll say is I too am in long-term recovery. And um, I've been, when I first, came around in 94, recovery houses were like really brand new. They had a lot to learn, but they were a lot healthier. Um, as time went on, recovery houses became a dangerous place for people in recovery. And with nobody monitoring, monitoring them, I think we lost a lot of people. Um, so this is gonna assist us in being able to monitor the recovery houses so that we can make sure that the residents that are living in the recovery houses are in a safe environment. So they'll be writing policies and procedures to ensure that the residents are informed of all the rules prior to coming. There'll be an orientation process, which um, which if it were, if I were looking for a recovery house, you can have that process before you come to the recovery house while you're still in treatment so you can make a decision based on that of which recovery house you wanna go into. Um, there's policies and procedures for funding management to make sure that no one is taking advantage of our residents' funding. Um, anything, any type of financial situation, any transactions have to be um, logged so that we can monitor them. That's anything that goes out, anything that comes in. We'll be able in our yearly inspections to make sure that the residents are receiving what they're supposed to and they're getting their money back, their deposit backs, and, and all kinds of stuff of that nature. There'll be criminal background checks for everyone that works in a recovery house from the house manager's position down. The house manager's position is an administrative position because they are responsible for everything that takes place in the recovery house. And they're also responsible for staff and volunteers. So that keeps it from being anybody living in a recovery house with short-term recovery, which is extremely dangerous because it's an ego position. And a lot of people end up going back out because of that. So the regulation said that this, the house manager is an administrative position. Um, safety and protection of residents. So there'll be many policies and procedures. Our main concern is protecting them as far as the physical aspects of the home, as far as the um, way they communicate with the individuals at the recovery house, residents participation in treatment and recovery support. Like Joy said, there are so many different ways to recover today. Um, there's spiritual ways, there's 12 step programs, there's all different ways and um, from policy and procedure, the client should be able to select what works for them as long as they're in treatment and long as they're in a recovery support process, then they should be able to uh, continue, in, continue on in their process, which is really important because when you come out of a residential program, 
And it just makes sense that long-term recovery would be the next step because the disease is coming back and in insidious. And so it takes a long time for your thinking and behaviors to change. And so that's why recovery houses are so important. Um, residents abstaining from alcohol and drug use. Um, that's part of the policies and procedures so that we can identify what it is that takes place. I also heard Joy talk about abusing in a recovery house and anyone that knows anything about recovery know that relapse is a part of recovery often and that a client shouldn't be sent back to the street because they did that. So we have the right policies and procedures so we can identify what their process is and they have to stick to it when they write it. Medication, use of security um, so that we can monitor what type of medications and how they're gonna protect their clients uh, excuse me, the residents by using their medications properly, locking them up properly, making sure if anything comes missing, they identify, they do the steps that's necessary to identify that. Um, when residents leave medication behind, we want to know how you're going to make sure that it's disposed of properly. So the policies and procedures are real specific um, and all of them are geared towards making sure that residents are safe from themselves and from others. Um, maintenance of the house and fire equipment. So um, each each recovery house has to have two exits from either floor that there are beds on. So we're working with the providers, assisting them with uh, making sure that if they don't have ladders from the second or third floor that they're able to put them in in order to be licensed. Um, so we've been able to do that. So just in case of a fire, we wanna make sure that they have two exits from each floor. Um, prohibition of requiring residents to relinquish public assistance benefits. So in our financial 717.25, seven, it talk, talks about um, that the recovery house, whether it's staff or anyone working at the recovery house cannot have a resident or make a resident relinquish any of their um, public assistance benefits, any of them. So they can't relinquish, they can't make them relinquish their paycheck. They can't make them relinquish their food stamps. They can't make them relinquish any public assistance benefits. So they have to work with the individual. And, and that way, um, they're not using their food stamps um, for things for everybody else, because that's not the way food stamps are meant to be used. They have a com we have a complaint management policy regulations that they have to write policies and procedures on so that the residents can complain, their family members can make complaints, and the community members can make complaints. Um, we have a, they have to create a structured way that anyone that needs to make a complaint on the recovery house can make a complaint to them as well as us so that we can help monitor the complaints that's coming in to recovery houses. And the emergency contact notification. So before, um, before the recovery houses was licensed and this was implemented, there were um, there were residents that would leave the recovery house and be gone for hours and no one would know where they were and sometimes never return. And we've had incidents and um, complaints about members being found dead, being found in other states, all kinds of things. So this emergency contact notification gives the recovery house up to 12 hours to notify the emergency contact person if the resident has left the house and they have no idea where they are. And so, like I said, all of the policies and procedures that they have to submit to us are for strictly for the um, safety of the residents. And um, I think that is going to improve, I know that is going to improve recovery houses tremendously because <clears throat> they'll be monitored. So we'll be monitoring all complaints. We'll be monitoring all um, all activities yearly when we go out and inspect. So that's going to just uh, encourage them <laughs> to do the right thing the right way. Also, before I finish, I just want to mention, wait a minute, I got another slide. Okay, so the recovery house licensing began, process began December 11th of this of last year. And very soon, June the 9th, all recovery houses that are receiving funding <clears throat> need to be licensed um, in the Commonwealth of Pennsylvania. Uh, there could be some consequences. Um, so recovery houses that's, that, that are being funded by federal or state funding, they need to make sure that they're licensed by right now, June the 9th which is a, a few days from now. Um, and we are working vigilantly trying to make sure that we can get as many as possible um, license um, individual so, so that they can continue to get the referrals from um, individuals with substance use treatment 
funding for the federal and state can get referrals from any, uh, any of our licensed facilities in the Commonwealth of Pennsylvania or any other, any other federally funded or state funded entity. Okay. And our resources, do you want to do the resources, Jody, or do you want me to go ahead and finish? It's up, sure, it's up to you. Okay, you can do them, please. Okay, sure. So we have our Get Now Hotline, uh, Get Now, Get Help Now Hotline. Maybe you should have done it, Fred. <laughs> you can call 1-800-662-HELP or 1-800-662-4357. That's available 365 days a year, 24 hours a day, seven days a week. Or you can text 717-216-0905. And there's also a chat link. And that's for if you need help with any, um, any support, um, getting connected with treatment resources, that's available for anyone um, that needs help. And there's also a link for your SCAs for, um, so sometimes I know that there was a question sent in ahead if um, somebody needs help connected for funding. Your single county authority is the place to go for funding. They can help connect you with resources for contracting. If it, you uh, want to get a house started and you want to get it, once it's licensed, your SEA can contract with you um, to fund that house. Um, and the one last thing that I wanted to say that Fred briefly mentioned was um, regarding medication in recovery houses. One of the requirements in our regulations is that our houses may not discriminate on, regarding anyone on medication and medication assisted treatment. They are required to accept all individuals that are on medication, regardless of the medication. So they cannot require that a person um, is on only Vivitrol or only a certain level of uh, methadone. Um, they have to take people on any type of MAT. So um, they must have policies around that medication. So. Um, I just wanted to um, make sure that that was pretty clear. So, and I think we are probably about out of time. So we'll turn it over to our next person. Thanks guys. Thanks Fred and Jody, really appreciate it. Uh, I'm really excited that Megan Cohen is with us. We had uh, the real pleasure of honoring right. Megan about a month ago at our annual fundraising event, our spring branch. And Megan is the founder of the Grace Project. She's remarkable. She's going to be sharing her story, not her entire story, probably. We would love to focus on. It would take too long. I know, it would, but that's okay. It's a, it's a beautiful story of recovery. And you're an amazing person. We're so grateful that you're with us, Megan. Thank you so much. Thank you. So, yeah, I think, um, you know, before I talk about what recovery housing did for me, it's important to understand a little bit more about my story. Um, and, you know, that kind of backs up why recovery housing is so important. So I was in treatment 71 times prior to getting sober. Um, what was different all the other times uh, leading up to the last time was that I didn't do anything when I left treatment. I would go into detox, go home after, or I would go into residential, I'd go to aftercare for maybe a day or two, but I would do it from home. Um, and then I would, I would relapse. Um, you know, so what that ended up looking like for me was just kind of this revolving door of, you know, going into treatment, going to jail, um, maybe doing a recovery house for like a week or so when I had no place else to go until, you know, they kicked me out for using, um, you know, kind of this just like cycle of that constantly. And then lots of homelessness scattered in there. Um, you know, and a big part of it was that I wasn't willing to take suggestions. I constantly thought like, I have this and I can figure this out and I can, you know, I can take this suggestion, but like I can leave this one. Um, and a lot of times, like I remember when I first, one of the first few treatment centers I went to, they mentioned recovery housing to me. And in my head right away, I was like, absolutely not. Like you guys are talking about a curfew, you're talking about structure. Like that is something that I, I do not, I don't want, I want no parts of it. And of course, because at that time, like, you know, I was in active addiction. Um, so I was resistant to it and it took me about, probably like two years of 
you know, kind of doing like the treatment shuffle until I finally went to recovery housing for the first time. Um, every time that I have attempted recovery housing, I can tell you there was a difference. All the times that I didn't go, I got zero days leaving treatment. The times that I did, I at least had a little bit of time. And I love what Joy said about, you know, just because somebody uses in a recovery house, it doesn't mean that it's a bad program or in treatment, because I can tell you, like, I have been, like I said, multiple treatment centers, multiple recovery houses. It wasn't the program that wasn't good. It was me. I wasn't willing to follow their rules. I wasn't willing to do like, you know, what the people in the house that had been there for a while and been successful, like what they suggested to me, I didn't want to do any of it. So what that led to, because, you know, I'm, I'm somebody in recovery, um, was me picking back up because I, I wasn't doing what I needed to make sure that I was okay. Um, so, you know, kind of fast forward a little bit um, for the sake of time. Like I said, in treatment 71 times, um, I got out of treatment. I was getting ready to be re uh, released and drug court told me that I had to go into a recovery house. Um, and they were a little bit strict on me because I had been in treatment so many times. I was kind of a flight risk and, you know, um, they had recommended me going to a very structured recovery house. Um, and I think probably like a week prior to them giving me, you know, that requirement, I, I had a meeting with them and I kind of broke down and I was like, look, just send me up state. Like, I can't do this. I've tried a thousand times. There's no point. Like, just send me up because what's going to happen is I'm going to get high and I'm going to run from you guys. Um, you know, and the, the supervisor was like, you have one more chance. Why not give it your all? So I made this like kind of silent agreement with myself that I was going to do everything that was suggested. And at the time it was to prove a point. It was going to be, okay, I, I agreed to 90 days. So and like I said, in my head, it was 90 days of doing what they tell me so that they can't say that I did anything wrong, that I didn't follow suggestions, and then I'm going back out. I'm picking up. Um, and that was 100% my plan. So, you know, when this, this came to me and they're like, okay, like you have to go to this structured recovery house. It's either this recovery house or a halfway house. Um, you know, my, my initial reaction was like, no way. I'm already on drug court. I don't want this extra structure. It's a lot. I'm not used to it. Um, I, I didn't want to do it at all. But I made this agreement with myself that I was going to do whatever was suggested. So, you know, I bit the bullet and I went. Um, and I can tell you, like, in the beginning, it wasn't easy because I was so used to living a certain way. And, you know, I didn't want to follow somebody else's rules. Like I was, I was used to living in the, in the street, you know, I didn't really follow any rules at all. Um, and then now here I am with like all this structure from, you know, a legal program and then also all this structure in a recovery house. Um, you know, so when I went in there in the first couple of weeks, I was like, once drug court tells me that I can move out, I'm out of here. I'm moving back in with my mom. So I don't have to pay rent. And, you know, all of these ideas in my head. Um, and luckily, like I said, with this house being as structured as it was, they had requirements there and like they pushed you to go to meetings, you know, and they drug tested you randomly and you had to go on job search and like get a job and learn how to be independent. And you couldn't lie. If you got caught lying, there was consequences. Um, so basically it was designed just to teach you how to live better as a person, like how any good person should be living. Um, and I remember, you know, calling my sponsor one of the first couple of days that I was in there and, um, I said, you know, I hate this house manager. She told me I'm shady and, you know, she needs to mind her own business with a lot worse language, but, you know, you get the gist of it. And um, my sponsor said, she was like, well, are you following the rules? And I was like, well, for the most part. And she was like, no, it's a yes or no. Are you following the rules? And I'm like, I, I guess I, I've, I've broken a couple. And she's like, right, so you are being shady. Those rules are in place for a reason. They worked for tons of people before you. And when you're in early recovery, you need all the structure you can get. You need to learn a new way of life, especially when you've been out on the streets as long as you have. Um, and she was right. So like when she said that, again, I'm still in this 90-day commitment with myself to do everything. So I'm like, okay, got it. Follow rules. Follow all the rules. So I started following the rules. Um, you know, and suddenly, and again, this, this came from me, this was, it had to come from me, like the structure wasn't enough in the beginning. So I made that decision. I'm going to follow this structure. I'm going to follow these guidelines. Um, and so I did, I started following the rules, um, a hundred percent. I got honest whenever I wanted to break them, I would tell on myself. Um, I remember I hung out with somebody that had less than 30 days sober at one point, And I felt so guilty about it that I told on myself and, you know, things started happening all of a sudden I'm feeling better. 
you know, laying my head down at night. I don't feel like I'm walking on eggshells around the house manager. Um, you know, the homeowner was in recovery for, you know, like 20 years or something around there. Um, you know, she would check in with me and like, here's this woman who I couldn't stand in the beginning and this house manager, I couldn't stand in the beginning, both of them together. I was like, they're terrible. And both of them are still in my life today. And I respect them so much and they do anything to help other people in recovery, but they're, they're tough, you know, they're tough. And, um, you know, it's crazy because like I said, I, you know, I did everything. It wasn't just the recovery house. It was everything. I chose to do AA. I chose to do the 12 steps. Um, I did therapy outside of that. I think that's very important. Um, you know, I, I really treated every aspect of myself. I started going to the gym again, watching what I eat, you know, going to the doctor, all these things to make sure that like Megan as a whole was good. Um, you know, and, and it just, I remember getting around that 90 day mark and I was sitting in the recovery house bed upstairs in the smallest room that they had there. And I started bawling my eyes out because I, I realized like, instead of wanting to run, I was craving the inner peace that I was starting to feel more than I was craving drugs. And it was the most bizarre thing in the world. Um, you know, and, and all of a sudden I had this crazy gratitude for not only the recovery house, but also for drug court, for, you know, my sponsor, for everybody that kind of helped me along the way. Um, you know, and, and what's even crazier than that is I didn't, you know, like I said, I swore I was going to move out when uh, drug court gave me the okay. They told me three months. And, um, you know, shortly after that, I think it was like the next week, my uh, probation officer came out and he said, all right, well, if you want to, you know, move back home with your mom, like you said, you wanted to, to save money, go ahead. And I was like, uh, yeah, I don't think that's a good idea. And he was like, what do you mean? And I'm like, well, I'm doing really well with the structure. If I go back home with mom, she's not home that much. I don't have a network there because the other piece of recovery housing is it helps you get a network because there's other women in the house or, you know, men in the house that are also trying to, to go down the same journey as you and like have the same priorities as you and trying to follow the same rules. So you get this network of other people with this common goal. And then they're also, you know, it's uncomfortable going to meetings by yourself in the beginning. So now you have people to go to meetings, you know, with you. Um, so it, it's just, it, it was overall, like it felt like home to me. So I made the decision that, no, I'm, I'm going to stay as long as I possibly can. And I ended up managing that recovery house. Um, probably when I had about, I want to say like nine months over. Um, and it was funny because like when I talked to the owner, she's like, I really did it. That, like, I thought you were going to be out this door as soon as you possibly could. And, uh, you know, she's like, and here you are. And, and it's crazy. Like I said, I, I still talk to her today. She checks in with me all the time. Um, when I'm making the decision to move out of that house was hard. It was scary because it gives you so much, like, you know, you, you have accountability. So like, if I'm acting different or if like my my vibe is off in a sense like the girls that lived in the house they knew me so well because we were living together that they could say hey Meg what's going on are you okay and kind of put me in check um you know so it, it just it played a huge role I think that if it weren't for the recovery housing I, I honestly don't know if I would be where I'm at today because I got so much out of it and every little piece is so crucial and that was one of the biggest pieces that affected so much else in my recovery um, you know, and it, it got me out of my own environment and I also don't know what time I'm supposed to stop. <laughs> so what time am I supposed to stop? You're, you're good. You're good. Okay. <laughs> yeah. Don't, don't worry. Don't want to rush you. <laughs> yeah. So, I mean, but, but that's, that's pretty much it. You know, my, my life, it honestly, I never thought that this was going to be something that I was going to be able to get. Um, you know, making that decision to, to stick to my word, go into that house, take suggestions, um, you know, be receptive. When I got that criticism, it, it's, it's made all the difference. And I, I honestly think like all the stuff that I learned in that house, I still apply to my life today. Beautiful. Thank you, Megan. Um, I, I, I really hope when we get to Q&A, yes, thank you. Um, when we get to q and I hope we can talk a little bit about why there are so few, few so many fewer places for women to find housing, because this is really a huge challenge. But I want to turn it over now to Keith Murphy, who's with us from the Rutgers Collegiate Recovery Program. Collegiate recovery is so exciting and so many great outcomes and love to hear more about it. So thanks for being with us, Keith. So basically, it's it's this. is um, My name is Keith Murphy. Uh, I go by he, him, his. I am serving now as the uh, interim director of the Alcohol and Other Drug Assistance Program at Rutgers University. Uh, I was initially hired as the um, 
as a recovery counselor, and my job there was to manage the day-to-day -day operations of the Rutgers Recovery House. I also want to just acknowledge the folks here who presented earlier. Like, thank you so much for all of that wonderful information about all the stuff that's, that's happening in the wonderful Commonwealth of Pennsylvania. Um, again, it's sadly, it's like a little, sometimes it just feels like we kind of get a hold of things too late, but obviously we're playing a little bit of catch up in terms of helping folks uh, who are in recovery from substance use disorders. But So I appreciate you all. I want to acknowledge your work here and being in this space. I also want to acknowledge and say that I am also a person in long-term recovery for about 22 uh, some odd years of abstinence-based recovery, but my recovery journey started much sooner. Um, and, it, and I often forget that as a part of my story is that part of my story is also uh, engaging in using methadone to help me uh, stay sober. That was not my pathway. It did not work for me because of so much stigma and shame. I just wanted to use methadone as a way to not really confront other issues in my life. So that was not the pathway for me. The pathway for me was abstinence-based recovery. I found uh, sobriety uh, and recovery by going to set, at this point, a, uh, a Christian-based Salvation Army type place in Morristown, New Jersey, which was ironically a town over from where I live. So life is pretty ironic. So I also want to acknowledge that thing. Um, and later on, talk about just, you know, the idea of recovery housing in the late 90s, early aughts was in New Jersey was close to impossible to find. And, and honestly, if the program that I was in did not offer like a leadership program, I would have been homeless after completion, completion of that program. And if I didn't fortunately find other folks in recovery who had found uh, a place to live that was in a legal rental uh, in the next town over, I would have then been homeless. I had no other options because the stigma was so great. NIMBY was a real thing and people weren't giving money to help house people who were in, in, in recovery. So it's important to understand the need for the compendium, and I don't say the continuum, but the compendium, all of the recovery support services to help people in their process and understand those things. So I wanted to be clear about that. So like I said, my job is the interim director of the uh, Alcohol and Other Drug Assistance Program at Rutgers University. I help manage and, and see the day-to-day operations of our collegiate recovery programs. Now, collegiate recovery is, has been around, believe it or not, since the late 70s. So it's kind of old, but it's kind of new at the same time. But Rutgers University was really the first place to develop uh, collegiate recovery housing. And that was in 1983. And ironically, it started as a small thing between four students, and I always have to give credit to Lisa Lateman, her brainchild to be like, hey, there were students who would who would meet with her every Thursday night because that was a party night on campus who needed support in their recovery. And it was hard for them to find things to do and to find other folks in their community. Obviously there are 12 steps and other things available, but it came out of this therapy group that, there, that the idea came, said, hey, in 1988, let's have a recovery house on campus. Um, and that was done with the idea of one, college campuses being abstinence and recovery hostile environments because we all have the perception and the idea of what college is supposed to be or how it's presented in the media, on film, and a whole bunch of other places as a place where people drink, use substances recklessly. And, and sadly, that is the case. But at Rutgers, uh, and I have to really shout out the State University, and I believe it's the State University's really uh, responsibility to be first in providing resources for, for people in the state. Um, in terms of especially recovery supports and, and mental health and other, and other things. But in 1988, uh, Lisa Lateman and four other students decided we need to find a place for, uh, for students in recovery to live where they don't have to live under the threat of folks using substances and having their recovery recoveries put in jeopardy. Uh, it took a while, took a lot, of, a lot of phone calls. And I, I always joke and say this, before the internet, there was the phone book. There was a lot of calls to the phone book, a lot of reaching out, a lot of things that weren't done before that Lisa Lateman and other, other people helped put together because it was not, it was something totally new and different. Now the recovery house on campus is kind of a blended model. It's peer directed, peer centered, but it's monitored. Um, we don't, there are no urine screens. Uh, it's not labeled as anything. It is a residence hall. I obviously will not tell you what that is because one stigma and anonymity of the students, but understand that it is on campus and it's there and it provides support for about up to 39 students. It's mixed gender. Uh, we believe wholeheartedly in, in diversity. 
uh, in that space. Uh, we don't tolerate homophobia, transphobia, or any type of racism in this space. And oftentimes, a lot of people who are in these spaces are the most marginalized, and they need a space where they can feel free to move through their process and understand uh, what it means to be a whole person, because they're coming in with a whole host of other problems and issues that drove them into active addiction. The other part of this thing is really important, and something that needs to be highlighted, that an education is a protective factor for a lot of folks. It is really a good incentive, and, and thank goodness for, for Megan's story, and you'll hear Mickey share too, is that one, there's something about having something to look forward to and anchor onto uh, and reestablish hope ongoing, because recovery is good, and there are other things that come, you know, the gifts of recovery people talk about, but there's something that's, that needs to be tangible for, for young folks to, to grab a hold to, to really move them along in their process. So one of the things that we actually talk about and really work around, and Mickey will also talk about this, is, is one, having, having fun as a young person in recovery is absolutely key. Having a safe and structured environment is absolutely key. And also understanding that it's their space. I try my best to get out of the way and make sure students feel like it is a regular residence hall and it is not and I repeat this, it is not a halfway house. Oftentimes I get calls from parents and so many other people like, hey, I'm looking for this type of place um, that, that provides a lot of structure for students or a young person coming out of treatment. And I'm like, no, we don't offer that. What we offer is a supportive place and a person needs, and thanks to Joy, uh, a person needs to be really outwardly motivated uh, to be a part of the Rutgers Recovery House. First, they have to be accepted into college, which is a whole other thing. But they have to understand that their recovery is theirs. And one of the things that I think that we hopefully will get into a, a discussion about is really the marriage of internal motivation and external motivation. And recovery houses are a great place for people to begin to understand that process and understand, like, what's the drive in me, right, that keeps me going? And how can the external that recovery house began to support that. And again, hearing Megan's story really highlighted that for me. So understand that a collegiate recovery program, again, is a supportive environment. It's within the campus culture that reinforces a decision for a student or anybody, uh, in this case, student, to disengage from addictive behavior. And that could be relationships, that could be uh, video gaming, it could be a whole bunch of other things, but it's intentional that they sever those relationships and begin to really graft on to other folks who are hopefully moving towards having healthy relationships with them, with themselves, maybe their families and other people in the, in the community in a totally different way. And oftentimes going to a new college or going to college is a way for students to understand who they are or embrace a new identity, not just be a person that is in recovery, but also be a member of a university culture, to be a student. What does that mean to study? What does that mean to engage those skills? What does it mean to deal with the frustration of having an exam period? What does it mean to have new relationships? What does it mean to have healthy relationships? What does it mean to go to a sports sporting event where there may be alcohol, but I'm gonna be the person that's over there? What does it mean to go to a party and there are going to be people around me drinking or using substances, but I'm going with a sober click and having fun. So the idea of a recovery house, and definitely on campus or a collegiate recovery program, is not to bubble wrap a student, but to give a student a safe place to come back to, develop communities, and learn how to re-engage life in a way where they can put recovery at the forefront and understand that they can see their life through a recovery lens and not have to sacrifice on other areas of their life. The other key piece of this, too, is accountability from other recovering students. That's something that's built into the whole thing. And again, we don't do any urine screens or anything like that because honestly, the norm, and, I'll, and, and again, I, I can't thank, thank Joy enough for, for her presentation. The norm is not for folks who, who have the disease, we'll just call it the disease for now, to be sober. That is not the norm. It is not first nature for, folks who are in recovery to be in recovery. Our first nature is to use. So that accountability is absolutely key for recovering folks. And we kind of forget that fact. That's why we need this additional support. We shouldn't get mad at folks who have a return to use or recurrence. We're doing honestly on some level for what comes naturally. We should almost expect it. But the accountability is something that's absolutely key, especially for a young person who this, this may be their first go around in treatment or their second or their third time 
to really practice new recovery skills and to have new skills and new peers to also engage in in a totally different way. It's also a way for them to have a normative college experience. It is the worst thing for someone to walk around with the stigma of someone, I can't go to certain places because the way I use is much different than other people. It's shaming. And that's one of the things that we really work against on the college campus. Um, it's sad. So one of the things here is just like, hey, you can go to a game, you can go to parties, you can have friends, and you don't have to hang the scarlet letter of being a quote unquote ag around your neck. You can go through and be just a regular student who uses support services to maintain their sobriety. So one, what are, what are college students in recovery doing or what are some of their challenges? Learning how to maintain abstinence. Now in our space, we, we promote abstinence-based recovery. That doesn't mean that students can't come in and have medication. Uh, I, I want to say that, but that's first and foremost, because they're, honestly, there are a lot fewer spaces for students or folks who, have, who are in recovery from severe substance use disorder to find places where they can be abstinent. Also, it's learning how to restructure their daily lives to avoid behaviors and social triggers that may have a return to use. Balancing demands of recovery and academics, we kind of forget that. Like, it's not just about recovery. Recovery is a portal that allows you to have a different kind of lifestyle. The other thing is, obviously, which is absolutely key, and thank goodness for making story, and we'll hear uh, from Mickey, too, is making friends. You know, we don't talk about, like, how do people make friends in recovery? If my whole part of my life has been centered on finding ways of using and finding more drugs, right, or substances, or that lifestyle, how do I find friends? How do I say, like, like they used to say in kindergarten, will you be my friend? Will you play with me? You know, as adults, we make it so hard. But the idea of collegiate recovery, uh, definitely as a resident, is to make it a lot easier. And there are different models of collegiate recovery throughout the country. There are about 180 programs uh, nationwide that are popping up all over the place because we're recognizing the need that students need that additional support. And the joke is, is that, you know, when, when the program was started at Rutgers, uh, people would say, well, hey, but aren't all the dorms uh, drug and alcohol free? And that's not the case, obviously. That's why we need, again, a recovery house and recovery supports. We do offer, and I'll say this, this is why we have a blended model. We offer individual counseling for students. Uh, we offer group counseling as a way to support their recovery. Um, one of the things that I don't like, and I'll be on the record for saying this, is that we often pathologize folks that are in recovery, not recognizing the benefits that folks in recovery can actually bring to our communities. And we don't often get a chance to see how recovery and other prevention work is really braided together to help create a community of health and well-being, no matter where we are. So we kind of miss the, 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 the downsides of having recovery folks in our local communities. So many people are afraid, like, well, that's going to be a using house. But I bet you for a long time, that'll probably be the most sober house on your block. It'll probably be the most vigilant and probably the safest house on your block. But you have to give folks in recovery a chance and give us a chance to provide housing that's integrated in the community so people can know what it's like to be a part of the community rather than redlining folks outside of uh, typical uh, residents. Uh, in your in your respective town but that's all i have um for the most part we're, we're sponsored again gratefully for the most part by a state grant that allows us to do activities which are absolutely key and again we believe in service work mickey's here because simply because i asked him and he believes in the power of recovery i can go on and on and on but i won't bore you all because i know that there's more stuff that we have to get to and i'm really more interested in hearing mickey and other people talk than hearing myself so thank you for the time and again Thank you for the invitation. I really appreciate it. Thank you so much, Keith. Yeah, Mickey, we're really glad you're here. Go ahead. You got it. Awesome. So yeah, my name is Mickey. I go by he, him, his pronouns. Um, I got into recovery in July of 2019. And uh, I've been at the, I actually am a resident at the Rutgers Recovery House. been a resident uh, since January of 2020. So right before COVID hit, which is kind of wild to think about now in retrospect. But yeah, so I'm, I think I've run like 10 minutes or so. So I'll focus a little bit on like when I first came in and then my experience in collegiate recovery as well. So I'll section off into those two things. So yeah, when I first came into recovery, I was in a treatment center and I was in specifically a halfway house. Um, 
which, you know, at the time I really enjoyed, like it was something that I really needed, um, like, like that structure in my life, because, you know, before that I was on the brink of homelessness, you know, my family didn't want me anymore, obviously, because of my use, like everything was just unmanageable, you know, I dropped out of college, I'm actually from PA too, I'm from Bucks County, and went to high school in Philly, went to my first college in Philly, so it's great to be represented in my home state, but side note, so, <laughs> uh, yeah, so, you know, things were falling apart for a while, and then, you know, I decided to engage in treatment because, you know, for a couple days, and I, I was saying this before uh, at a meeting a little a couple weeks ago, I remember feeling a couple days before I went into treatment, like there was like this other being inside of me that I couldn't control what it did. It did, it made all the decisions for me. You know, I, I, I felt like I wasn't consciously acting, you know, I wasn't able to be in the present. It was all about how I was going to get what I needed to get and able to escape myself a little bit more. And, you know, there's these questions being posed about, and I'll get to this later too, about having fun in recovery. Well, for me, the thing that was like, I was thinking about this earlier today is like, I didn't have, I didn't know how to have fun in active addiction at all. Like all I knew, all I was trying to do was survive and like, you know, none of it was fun. So when I came into recovery and what got a network, things became extremely great. You know, like I was able to have fun, but I'll get to that in a second. So, you know, I got into this halfway house and, you know, I had all this structure in my life and it was really, really important for me. I was actually supposed to stay for about 30 days at first initially. And I, you know, around like my 20th day in treatment, I, you know, I was going to a 12 step fellowship and, you know, I had a home group, I had a commitment in that home group. And, you know, I had people in, the net, in my network that weren't just in a halfway house. And I decided that I wanted to stay a little bit more time. I wanted to stay for the 90 days. So I decided to leave my previous college um, and pursue treatment because at that time I didn't feel like I was ready to be in college. I didn't feel like I was ready to be in my home life environment. Like Megan was sharing before, like I, you know, my mom's not there most of the time and, you know, it's just where I used, and that's where all my using friends were. I didn't have a network in my hometown. So I decided to stay for 90 days. I got more involved with my 12-step fellowship. Um, and I think that's, I, I, I say my 12-step fellowship because I think what they gave me, especially in the beginning, was uh, a network. Um, and having that network is so crucial for me, you know, because I've, I've had times in my recovery where I didn't have a network or I felt like I didn't have a network, and it was really hard for me. Um, so, you know, I was talking to my therapist at the treatment center, um, and she recommended, you know, I look into Rutgers because they had a recovery house. And I was like, I don't want to like, I don't want to hang out. I don't want to go to school in Camden. That's all I thought of Rutgers. I didn't know there was three campuses and there was New Brunswick. So, um, yeah, so, you know, I got in touch with Keith and, you know, I asked about the recovery house and he was like, yeah, just apply. And then we, once you get in, we can talk a little bit more about it. Um, but there was like this really crazy period of my life where from th uh, three months in recovery to six months in recovery, I was back home with my family. So I left the treatment center for 90 days. I was waiting to, I got accepted to Rutgers, thankfully. And I was waiting to come into the uh, Rutgers recovery house. So I had to go back to Bucks County and I, you know, I just kind of rebuild a network and it was really difficult for me. Because, you know, I was so used to the people, I, I went to the treatment center in Poconos, and I was so used to that network um, where, like, I felt really isolated and depressed and all of these really negative emotions from that three to six-month period. Um, and so, like, sort of going along the lines of, like, having fun in recovery, for me and, like, my experience in recovery is I've always had the most fun when I felt the most in touch and connected with my network. And, like, when I have people I can talk to if I'm struggling, when I have people I can talk to when I'm doing good, you know, people that can call me out if I'm, if I think I'm doing too good, you know, or, you know, everything in between, like, cause I can only do as much as like my, so like for me, like my success and the things that I can do with my life and the happiness that I feel is completely dependent on the people that I surround myself with and the people that have helped me along this journey. And like, I think so, something that was very, interesting that Keith said earlier was like you know coming into this community at Rutgers 
I didn't exactly know what I wanted. And, you know, I was kind of just like not fumbling around, but like I was still, you know, I was motivated to stay in recovery, but I didn't really exactly know like how to branch out into like other areas of my life. And over these last couple of years, I've, you know, I've stayed connected with the 12-step program. I've made some really amazing connections uh, at school and in the recovery community in general. And I feel like I have a sense of purpose in my life. Like I've just, 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 I feel grounded now and, and things feel um, more consistent for me. And it's, it's an amazing feeling, you know, and it, it is weird at Rutgers, uh, at the recovery house, because I get that same kind of feeling when people are like, oh, so you're still at a halfway house. And I'm like, it's not exactly a halfway house. It's a little bit different. It's, it is um, very independent, which can be also kind of struggle sometimes because it's ex- it's an extremely independent, independent environment. So like if I wanted to just like sleep until 6 p.m. every single day and like not go to class, I'm 100% allowed to do that. But so it, it's, it is a challenge within itself to like stay motivated. Um, there's a lot of that self-motivation in an environment like this. And on the campus and, you know, the community that's here and the, and the community of young people in recovery in New Brunswick is phenomenal. So, you know, you go out, Every weekend, we'll do a lot of really, really fun things. And, you know, it keeps us all connected. And, like, you know, I've seen a lot of people in this area. You know, I've seen a lot of people grow in the house. And it's, you know, it's a real gift to be able to, like, see those kind of things in recovery. It's the kind of stuff that keeps me coming because, you know, being there for other people, it helps me, you know. And when other people are there for me, I feel that love. Um, so yeah, having fun of recovery is all about connection for me. It's all about having those people and having people I can talk to, having people I can go hang out with. And I like what Keith said also about, <laughs> about like learning how to have friends again in recovery because I didn't know how to do anything when I first came in. I felt like a kindergartner, you know, asking the playground if you want to come play with me because I didn't know how to talk to people. I didn't know how to make friendships or connections. And in recovery, I learned how to do those things through 12 step, through the Rutgers Recovery House to the treatment center I was at and everybody that was with me along the way. So I'm really grateful for everything that has been given to me thus far. And I'm really grateful to be able to speak on this panel. Um, I can thank Bob and Kim and Keith and everybody. Um, so yeah, that's all I got. Thanks so much. Um, thanks everybody for, for all the information that you shared and everything you had to say. It's always, uh, uh, it's a really, really great panel and so many different perspectives and stuff. And I know Joy was chomping at the bit to share about some collegiate recovery. Uh, she had something she wanted to throw in about the collegiate recovery stuff. So I'll let her do that before we get to well, our questions and stuff. And I appreciate all the stuff that you said, Keith. I wanted to mention, because I know that we have some probably family members here, that um, going back to college is not something that... Um, is not the answer to recovery. Sometimes there are people who are like, oh, my loved one can get right out of treatment and go right back to school because that's going to fix them. And I've been in parent groups, Kim knows, you know, that, that that's been a thing for families. Oh, they could do it right back to school and then that's going to make them well. And, and that is not true. The motivation recovery for recovery has to come first. The, the groundwork for and the commitment for recovery. And again, that doesn't mean that per, a person might not return to use. That doesn't have to do with necessarily motivation. Again, that's many factors. But um, post-acute withdrawal symptoms, there's multiple reasons why right after treatment, somebody, because I, I know that families sometimes see collegiate recovery as, oh, my kid can go to treatment and then just jump right back into school and that will fix them. That won't fix them. Recovery will fix them. Therapy will fix them. Time and commitment. And then to be given the opportunity to be in the environment like collegiate recovery to be supported. But I just wanted to like jump in there with that because Kim knows I've been around parent groups and parent meetings for a really long time. And I treated parents in the adolescent center when I worked at another treatment center. And it it, it really is not the answer. It's a piece of the puzzle. It certainly does. It is a, it is a helpful piece of recovery, but it is not the solution. So I just wanted to throw that in there, Keith. I, I think you gave a lot of great information, but I could see from the parent mind, parents going, Ooh, 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 you know, so uh, just um, give it time, give somebody some time. 
before they make that decision. Thanks, Joy. Did you want to interject there, Megan? No, I just wanted to kind of back it up a little bit. Um, so I, you know, on both ends, because I had tried to go back to college two other times before this last time, um, you know, after doing treatment, both times it was like immediate. I did it like school's going to save me. Um, and both times within the first three weeks, I was done. I stopped going. Um, I actually two nights ago, just completed. Um, it was my last night of college for my associate's degree. I went back this time around. <laughs> Thank you. I went back this time around. I waited until I had about nine months. Um, and even with that, I did it a little bit early because I did it before, um, getting a job. Cause it was during COVID. I'm like, Oh, I have all this time. And then I started a nonprofit. So then it was working full-time school, full-time and, um, you know, running this nonprofit. So it's definitely there, there's times where it can be very stressful. And I can tell you, I'm, I was going to continue for my, my bachelor's. And then I was like, let me take a little bit of a break, kind of get some things under control. But on the other end of it, it was also amazing because, you know, I, I did keep my recovery first, even with all that going on and being able to have something there when I was ready. Um, and again, with keeping recovery first, it, it was a good feeling and being able to maintain, you know, really good grades and to finally be able to say like three times later, I got my degree. So, you know, it's there on both ends. It's just about when some, when someone's ready, but it is not the solution, but you know, it can help when the timing's right. Definitely. Yeah, so I I agree with everything. Like Joy, you said all the things, and Megan, congratulations. Yeah, there's, and I, I think this this is for all of us here. One of the things that um, there's the cost that's associated again with with college, especially for folks who who shelled out a lot of money for treatment. Oftentimes, sadly, uh, parents have and loved ones have have put their houses, mortgaged their homes, so that people could go through treatment. And then not to mention the additional cost of college, but I will say this about the state of New Jersey, if you complete treatment and New Jersey sees uh, the disease of addiction as a disease, uh, the Division of Vocational Rehabilitation Services will pay for your um, full free, your undergraduate degree, because they see it as a vocational uh, issue. So it's a, it's a block, to, um, block to employment. So that is also a resource that's out there Obviously, if you meet financial criteria, the state will cover that, that, that thing. The other part of it is, too, and, and Megan touched on it, is key, uh, community college. Community college is a great way to kind of for folks to get their feet wet and understand, do I even want to go to a four-year school? Is that for me? Or just to, to understand again that, like, let me get, understand how my brain works and how it functions and to be in a college environment and to maybe even read or to just study again what that looks like. It's a really a great place to get started. The last thing I'll say, and this I think this is the piece for, I think for everybody is that one of the things that I absolutely cannot stand, um, and I wish there was a better way, and I hope we are we're working towards this, is that people in early recovery go through so many transitions. They go through so many transitions from, from treatment to finding housing and when they're in the most vulnerable space. And it's so hard for people to find good, reliable, and dependable resources where they can land and feel safe and feel supported. And one of the things that I say to folks is like, I don't care if you don't come to Rutgers. My first thing is one, I want you alive and I want you to go to a place where you feel like you can be a whole person and you can thrive in your recovery. Rutgers is like a distant third to me because I know it's not an inconvenience. This is the thing about life or death. So I just wanted to put that out there too. Thanks, Keith. Appreciate you throwing that out there. Um, we do have some additional questions that have been coming in and that people asked ahead of time. Um, one of the ones that came in the chat during the program was, you know, do, is there any information on the average cost of recovery um, house or recovery residency? I don't know if that's something that, um, you know, either anecdotally or if there's data, whether Joy or Fred or Megan could answer um, just based on experience or you know, I know there's different pay scales for, for different programs. Yeah, that's what I was going to say. And it also depends on the area. Um, so like the average recovery house cost is, you know, different in Florida than it would be 
in like Bucks County, I can tell you in, in Bucks County, I mean, I've been out of it for a little bit, but my boyfriend actually uh, just is, got zoned for a recovery house. Um, so he was kind of looking at all the, the current averages and they're, they're like around 170 um, to like some are like 185 of like the standard houses. And then there's also really nice houses. I've heard of them being, and I'm not exactly like a thousand dollars a month for like these really beautiful, huge houses. Um, so it really depends. It depends on the area. It depends on if they're just going into a standard house, um, which, you know, just the standard houses are, are just as good. Um, or if they, you know, they want something extravagant and where it's at. That's 175 to 185 a week, correct? Yeah. Yes, yeah. yes, sorry. <laughs> yeah. yeah, great. Any other interjections on that or? No, they just really do vary. I mean, real, every recovery house, depending on their level of care, depending on their, again, we go back to like recovery house versus halfway house. You know, the, the more professionals you have that are engaged in the, in the setting, you know, do they do kind of some clinical work on site or not, you know, a lot of that depends on the structure and the funding and, and yeah, there's, there's really, really expensive recovery houses. And there's ones that people can afford once they get a, a part-time, you know, or a full-time job somewhere that they can afford, you know, afford on their own. And there are some organizations. I, I do want to shout, like shout out to Bridge Beyond Addiction in the Allentown area, for instance, that provides seed money, for somebody who has no funds to go from one recovery to go from an inpatient treatment program to a recovery house, there are some resources out there, and that's not the only place or the only city, I believe. Um, that you know, there are ways to to research and get some funding. Like, oh, I love OVR in New Jersey. I, that's so cool. It's not every state. I wish every state would. I wish that would be a, a national thing. But um, there are multiple ways to. Too. And that's an important question to ask, you know, because different recovery houses allow for people to kind of put a small deposit up front and then get a job. You know, every every house is different. Well, and keep in mind, too, it really depends on where someone is in their recovery. You know, that early out of treatment, early out of incarceration, early into sobriety is such a vulnerable time. So more structure is going to probably come with a little bit of a higher price tag. That doesn't mean you have to stay there for a year. You know, so maybe you could transition and some of these, you know, these really well organized places have some step down houses, you know, so that there's something mm -hmm. for like a longer term to ride things out. My, my son spent three years in the Scranton Poconos area. He spent three months in a really structured house, but then he was like in a house for about a year with two guys that got random urine screens. And then he spent another couple of years just in that community with sober friends that he met, but they all stayed connected to that house. It was like their hub. So there are really affordable ways to spend as much time, you know, that, that length of stay, length of connection to treatment resources and that fellowship is, it was everything for him at least. Yeah. Yeah. And I think um, Joy touched on the one thing about finding funding to support more housing is those like, you know, there are some organizations that do that seed money that'll help pay for, um, you know, one or two weeks of, of entry into a recovery house. So that may be working with the treatment center to see if they have any relationships with those types of organizations uh, and things like that. Um, and also your single county authorities. Mm hmm. Reaching out to yeah. them, they have relationships. Case management is extremely important. Um, and, and I don't know if that was talked about too much, but case management is key. Uh, a lot of times, it, it used to, it, in Pennsylvania, we've really tried to work at getting case management out of the treatment session, really separating it out. The crisis needs to, you know, the non-treatment needs, like, housing, for instance, or if someone needs help with a, their electric bill or, or food, let the case management help that and let the treatment session be for the treatment, treatment plan, work on the treatment plan. So there are case managers available through the SCAs and through if they have medical assistance through their behavioral health managed care organizations, there are case managers available. And some of the oversight, the they have money available that for recovery housing. 
So there, there are tons of resources in Pennsylvania, tons of money available for recovery housing. Case Thanks. managers can help access that. Thanks, sure. Case. I, I just have a question because I, I don't know, and this is coming from a place of uh, ignorance. I want to understand. Um, obviously, housing discrimination is a bit, is the, how it's set down the law is the minimum. But I wonder, is in Pennsylvania, is there housing for LGBTQIA folks? And uh, like specifically? Um, so I'll take that one. I just opened two houses in Philadelphia that are specific towards the LGBTQ community. And Can they're you? working tremendously hard to get more. And I'm hoping that it spreads because we need to stay clean too. Can you put the information for um, that in the chat? I only know of one and it's attached to a treatment center. Um, so that it, they're hard to locate. I definitely will. Thank you. Mm -hmm. and, and Fred, thank you for that, uh, for sharing that. Uh, and it's specifically for, because one of the things I, I, I ask treatment centers when they, they, you know, they come by with their coffee cakes and they want to give me their pamphlets. Um, I'm like, do you, one, do you offer scholarships? Two, what do you do? How do you help support, actively support marginalized folks in your space beyond just like we have LGBTQIA friendly uh, spaces as opposed to like this this programming is designed for LGBTQI folks or black and brown folks. Like, are there, are there recovery houses in PA that actually support those marginalized folks? Well, like, I'm completely honest with you. I'm, um, I'm learning a lot more as I open recovery house. Just for instance, like I said, I was in Philadelphia and I'll be probably out Pittsburgh, but they have, um, a heavy, a lot of diversity. I'm getting ready to start doing paperwork on um, couples in early recovery. I just did a mothers and children um, house while I was in Philadelphia. So I'm sure it's more across the Commonwealth of Pennsylvania. That's just what I've been projecting, you know, working right now. But um, I was surprised because I didn't know when I went about the LGBTQ house until I got there. But it's specifically for that and they are working on opening two more because the population there in Philadelphia is extremely large. And so it's one of the quick, quickest growing recovery uh, houses that's there. So I'm thinking that um, people are becoming more open and I know that by licensing them, we'll be able to monitor them and assist them because there'll be services available for that population that wasn't available before, such as like um, Jody was talking about the SCA funding, um, so that people don't have to have jobs when they first get into recovery houses. They can stay in treatment for a while and then transition into school, transition into uh, work, and um, not older recovery house uh, hundreds of dollars by the time they get a job. So it, it's working, it's going to work in their favor, and the diversity is definitely showing up. Okay, so I will definitely add the information for the recovery house, the specific LGBTQ in the chat. Okay. Thanks, Fred. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and um, Kim, you want to take us out then? Yeah, yeah, guys, we had so many other questions. So, you know, as I said in the chat for our attendees, I hope you noticed in the chat, I, I said, please visit that follow-up page. Um, because the contact info for our presenters is there. So if you have specific questions for them, you can also email me and I'll try to get you the answers. Um, it's Kim at conversation.zone. So yeah, anything that panelists that you would like to have us include on that follow-up page, that's going to be the landing place for, for follow-up. So um, I, I really can't thank you all enough. Obviously we need to continue this conversation. Um, there's a lot, a lot to unpack here, but really you were all just fantastic. And congratulations to Megan and, and to Mickey. And thank you. Your personal stories are always, always so valuable. And so we're just so honored to hear from you. So, um, but thank you all. Amazing. Great job. Thanks, guys. Thanks, everyone. Thanks for having yeah. me.